Leviticus chapter 13. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, a scab or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leprous sore, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priests. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair of the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore, infectious. Uh, then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. So the priest is the doctor. And of course, in this case, we're not talking about medical advancements. Uh, the Bible does not make mistakes about medicine. All of the Old Testament that gives us insight into dietary laws, uh, cleanliness, all these things are accurate. Uh, but that's not the main point. The main point in this case is that there is a spiritual element that needs to be developed from these things. And you guys remember that even when we were talking about dietary laws, uh, you don't eat a shark, for example, because it doesn't have uh, scales. It has fins, but no scales. Uh, animals that have cloven hooves and chew the cud are okay. Those ones that have paws, no. Uh, remember all that. And it wasn't so much eating a, you know, a bear, for example, which would be considered unclean. Uh, a lot of people in North Idaho eat bear. Uh, it's not so much that eating bear is a sin or it's not so much that eating bear is going to be bad for your health or that you're going to die if you eat it, but it is that God was teaching the children of Israel discernment and he wanted them to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil. And so in this case, likewise, we continue even in the concept of what is true in a natural sense, in a medical sense, just as was true with the dietary laws or the laws of uncleanness. We just last uh, Wednesday, or was it the Wednesday before, we talked about a woman after having a baby and uh, the time of separation and all these kind of things. It's not that the woman herself is poisoned or unclean, but there was specific reasons for God allowing for a 30-day or a 60-day window, uh, or is it 40 and 80 uh, for this woman to have recovery time and to, and to be able to have health and strength and to be preferred uh, in that process. And so there is no uh, error in the biological side of it. There's no error in the sciences. Uh, but the, the, the fundamental idea is discernment. And in this case, we're discerning a medical condition, leprosy or an infectious disease that has been... Uh, it actually accurately described from the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew language. So the priest becomes the doctor. Uh, this is something important, and we'll see this developed as we work our way through this, uh, that even when in the New Testament, Jesus uh, tells a guy, uh, once he's been healed, go show yourself to a priest. Well, because they were under the Old Covenant still during the life and times of Jesus, in his earthly ministry, and it was appropriate for the priest to give him a bill of cleanness. In other words, hey, you're good to go. Everything's fine. Go back and be in the population. And so the priest was able to examine whether a person was infectious or not. And of course, again, as I mentioned, this is going to relate to a spiritual element and the typology that's associated with leprosy, but we'll first work our way through it uh, talking about uh, the disease itself, and some specifics that are used as identifiers for whether or not it's actually infectious or not. So, the priest shall examine the sore on the skin of the body, and if the hair of the, on the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous sore, then the priest shall examine him and pronounce him unclean. So obviously there's a level of transparency, this, the hair that is growing out of this leprous area has turned white. For whatever reason, it seems that the infection draws out the color of the, uh, the hair. Uh, and so, not to worry, anyone? <clears throat> uh, 
But if the bright spot is white on the skin of his body and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, so it doesn't have that translucent effect uh, than the skin, and the hair is not turned white, then the priest shall isolate the one who has the sore for seven days. Now, that will be important, so underline that in your Bible because we'll come back to that, the seven days. And the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, so a week later, and if indeed the sore appears to be as it was, and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall isolate him another seven days. So now you're going to have a 14-day window where there is going to be examination to determine whether there's actually a problem. Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. That would be, in this case, now down to 14. And indeed, if the sore is faded and the sore is not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scab should at all spread over the skin, after he has been seen by the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen by the priest again. And if the priest sees that the scab is indeed spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean, it is leprosy. It's infectious, it's spreading. When the leprous sore is on the person, then he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall examine him, and it, indeed, if the swelling on the skin is white, and it has turned the hair white, and there is a spot of raw flesh in the swelling, it is an old leprosy on the skin of his body. The priest shall pronounce him unclean and shall not isolate him, for he is unclean. If the leprosy breaks out all over the skin and the leprosy covers all the skin of the one who has the sore from his head to his foot, wherever the priest looks, then the priest shall consider, and indeed, if the leprosy has covered all of his body, he shall pronounce him clean, who has the sore. It has all turned white, he is clean. When the raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean, it is leprosy. And so we're, we're dealing with the kinds of manifestations of what is actually infectious and what is not infectious. And so certain things can spread that are not infectious and certain things can spread that are. In the case of the, the raw flesh being exposed, this transparent, translucent skin has broken open and there by this time is infection. Uh, obviously, they're saying, look, this is a problem and this has to be dealt with. Uh, it is unclean. And the priest, verse 15, shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. Or if the raw flesh changes and turns white again, he shall come to the priest, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the sore is turned white, then the, pri the priest shall pronounce him clean. Who has the sore, he is clean. So there's healing taking place. The body develops a boil if the body develops a boil in the skin and it is healed, and in the place of the boil there comes a white swelling or a bright spot, reddish white, then it shall be shown to the priest. And if, when the priest sees it, it indeed appears deeper than the skin and its hair is turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous sore which has broken out of the boil. So again, uh, it starts like a boil, and then all of a sudden you've got uh, greater difficulties with that boil and the, the, the translucent skin, the white hair, uh, and breaking forth the boil, of course, when then exposed raw flesh. But if the priest examines it, and indeed there is no white hairs in it, and it is not deeper than the skin, but is faded, then the priest shall isolate him seven days. And if it should all spread... Uh, spread all over the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous sore, again spreading. If the bright spot stays in one place and is not spread, it is the scar of the boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. So again, it's, Brenda's smiling. It's, uh, you're, it, it, you're like, what, what? Uh, just bear with me. I'm, uh, you, it's easy to get bogged down in, uh, in Leviticus, isn't it? 
This is why you've hardly read the book, right? Am I right? You know, put a little blood on the earlobe and the toe. And, you know, we, we already dealt with all that, though, right? And we found out it has great meaning to it. But obviously something people would make fun of, uh, not being Jews ourselves in particular. If the body receives a burn in, uh, on its skin by fire and the raw flesh of the burn becomes a bright spot, reddish, white, or white, then the priest shall examine it. And if indeed, if the hair of the bright spot is turned white and it appears deeper than the skin, it is leprosy broken out in the burn. Therefore, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous sore. So it could have been inspired, this weak spot where the body then goes to uh, address that concern and uh, as our white cells do rush to infections and so forth and all of a sudden you've got a problem because uh, the the, uh, the body has now been made vulnerable in that area and all of a sudden it breaks out in a white sore or whitish red sore transparent and also pulls out the color of the hair then it is leprosy he is, shall be pronounced unclean verse 26 and if the priest examines it and indeed there is no white hairs in the bright spot and it is not deeper than the skin but is faded then the priest shall isolate him seven days and the priest shall examine him and on the seventh day and if it has at all spread over the skin then the priest shall pronounce him unclean it is a leprous sore again the seven days is important if the bright spot stays in one place and is not spread on the skin but has faded it is a swelling from the burn the priest shall pronounce him clean for it is the scar from the burn. Verse 29. If a man or a woman has a sore on the head or the beard, then the priest shall examine the sore, and indeed, if it appears deeper than the skin, and there is in it thin yellow hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a scalp leprosy of the head or beard. And so now we start looking around to see all the bald guys that have a little bit of white hair and we start worrying, <laughs> right? I don't think so. Verse 32, on the seventh day, the priest shall examine the sore. And indeed, if the scale is not spread and there is no yellow hair in it, and the scale does not appear deeper than the skin, he shall shave himself, uh, but the scale he shall not shave. Uh, and the priest shall isolate the one who has a scale another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall examine the scale. And indeed, if the scale is not spread over the skin and does not appear deeper than the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. He shall wash his clothes and be clean. And if the scale should at all be spread over the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall examine him, and indeed, if the scale is spread over the skin, the priest uh, need not seek for yellow hair, he is unclean. And if the scale appears to be at a standstill, and there is black hair grown up in it, the scale was healed. He is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. If a man or a woman has bright spots on the skin of the body, specifically white bright spots, then the priest shall look, and indeed, if the bright spots on the skin of the body are dull white, it is a white spot that grows on the skin, he is clean. And or as for the man whose hair has fallen from his head, he is bald, but he is clean. And I'm working my way there. My kids used to say I had a forehead, now they say I have a five head. And it's, it's, it's continuing, you know. That's just what happens to us, right? And we're clean. That's the good news. He whose hair has fallen from his forehead, he is bald on the forehead, but he is clean. And if there is on the bald head or bald forehead a reddish white sore, it is leprosy breaking out on the bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall examine it, and indeed, if the swelling of the sore is reddish white on his bald head or on his bald forehead, as the appearance of leprosy on the skin of the body, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall surely pronounce him unclean. His sore is on his head. Verse 45, now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, 
and he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean all the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Underline that. Underline that. Also, if a garment has a leprous plague, now we're talking about garments. First, we're talking about the body itself. We're talking about garments. We will, we're not going to get there tonight, I don't think, but we're going to end up getting to houses too, dwelling places and so forth. But now we're talking about garments. If a garment has a leprous plague in it, whether it is a woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it is in the warp or woof of linen or wool, whether in leather or in anything made of leather, so linen fabric, wool fabric, or leather fabric. And by the way, if you guys, uh, if you look these words up in the Hebrew, they're uh, very vague. In fact, woof, W-O-O-F, as is translated in our uh, King James, in New King James, uh, some of the other modern translations force their own uh, Le definitions into it as linen or wool. Uh, it's very unclear what they're talking about here, but one of them, the, war the wharf, they said uh, in the Hebrew definitions in the dictionary, the, the Hebrew dictionary said that it is a mixed fabric, and that is 100% not true because the Jews were not allowed to wear mixed fabric. So in the law, the same law that says don't eat bacon, says you can't wear polyester cotton blend. Okay, so you see what I'm saying? So, no, it's not. It has to do with linen and wool and leather. Whether in leather or anything made of leather, and if the plague is greenish or reddish in the garment or in the leather, whether in the warp or in the woof, or in any leather, it is a leprous plague and shall be shown to the priest. Isn't it amazing the Bible actually is so accurate about all this stuff. The priest shall examine the plague and isolate that which is the plague for seven days. He shall examine the plague and on the seventh day if the plague is spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, in the leather or in anything made of leather, so linen or wool, woven upside down, right side or up and down, whatever you like, in anything made of leather, the plague is an act of leprosy, it is unclean. In the garment. He shall therefore burn the garment in which is the plague, whether warp or woof, in linen or, or wool or in linen or anything of leather, for it is an active leprosy. The garment shall be burned in the fire. If the priest examines it, and indeed the plague is not spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof or in anything made of leather, then the priest shall command that they wash the thing uh, in which is the plague, and he shall isolate it another seven days. Fourteen days, right? Then the priest shall examine the plague after it has been washed, and indeed if the plague has not changed its color, though the plague is not spread, it is unclean. Uh, you shall burn it in the fire. It continues eating away whether the damage is outside or inside. And so the inside or the outside of wharf or woof, whether it be linen, wool, or leather. Now, if the priest examines it, and indeed the plague is faded after washing it, then he shall tear it out of the garment, whether it out of the warp or woof, or out of the woof, or out of the leather. But if it appears again in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, or anything made of leather, it is a spreading plague. You shall burn with fire, that in which is the plague. So if you wash the garment, either warp or woof, whether it is made of leather, if the plague has disappeared from it, then it shall be washed a second time and shall be clean. This is the law of the leprous plague in the garment of wool or linen, either in the warp or woof or anything made of leather to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. So first of all, let's go back and talk about this. Um, a lot of discussion about leprosy, whether it's curable or incurable. Uh, research years ago, a few years ago, said that it was not curable. 
what has come now to new discovery, I don't know. Uh, but from what I understand, it's not humanly curable. That was the latest uh, information that I was able to develop. Uh, and um, the disease itself is kind of a curious disease because it affects the nerves and makes you so that you can't feel pain. So a lot of times people say, well, leprosy will like eat away at your fingers or your nose or your ears fall off and so forth uh, because it just eats away at your flesh. But technically, from what I understand, leprosy is a, a kind of disease that takes away the sensitivity so that your, your limbs and your, you know, the, the, your fingers or whatever doesn't heal. And so you could put your hand on a hot stove and burn your hand, you wouldn't even feel it. It also then doesn't heal because of the fact that the nerves aren't functioning properly, therefore rescuing that part of the body by sending the signal to the brain to send the signal to uh, the, uh, the blood to rush to that area of the body to heal, whether it be platelets or uh, the white cells. Red cells included, of course, in the, the tripart nature of our blood, among other things. So technically, there was really no healing for it uh, other than God. Now, the interesting thing about it is that in the passages, you have this ability to show yourself to be clean and then to be unclean. Uh, you have the ability to show yourself to a priest as unclean and then to be examined again and actually be pronounced clean because you're getting better. But there's no record in the Bible of anyone actually getting better from leprosy except by the miraculous. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, Jesus is coming down the side of the, the mountain of the Galilee down toward uh, the Galilee Lake, uh, river, or the, you know, it's called the Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake. And um, a guy comes out from being alone. And he's got leprosy. And he tells the Lord, if you can, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the Lord touches this guy. And I, it always amazes me that the Lord was not afraid to touch the man that's unclean. It's probably the first time the guy had been touched in years. And human touch is a very big deal. This guy comes out of nowhere. He's been a living alone. And Jesus touches him and says, I am willing, be thou cleansed. But then he says, I need you to go show yourself to the priest. And it only then validates even more so what for others would have been so elusive. Why would we have a law that if somebody is cleansed from leprosy, that they should go show themselves to the priest when we have really no people getting healed of leprosy? I mean, other than the rare Naaman, right? Yeah, seven times, right? Or the guy that's healed of leprosy. The blind see, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed. Jesus said during his earthly ministry, manifesting the power of the kingdom of God. And then go show yourself to the priest, fulfilling something powerfully. And so it causes you to then reflect on the fact that leprosy is a type. Now, not dealing substantially with all the medicine and the biological and the disease. Le leprosy is a type of sin. It cannot be healed but by miraculous intervention. You can't heal yourself. No physician can heal you. The sin problem is deeper in the skin, in our flesh, in our person than anything we can ever handle without Christ's divine, miraculous intervention. It's only he that can heal it. And it, he provides, even under the law, the ability for a priest to examine and say, cleansed. Number two, leprosy makes you have lack of feeling. I can put my hand on the burner and burn it, it doesn't even feel anything, as does sin. Sin can make you numb. Especially, I was thinking about um, uh, marijuana. I don't have experience with marijuana, so I can't really 
speak to it, but what I've noticed in the long game with a lot of people that are regular users of marijuana, people that smoke it all the time, every day or something, they have a tendency to lack motivation. And they kind of get stuck. And they don't grow. They don't mature. Nothing changes in their life and they become semi-apathetic or completely apathetic. They just become numb to the realities of what they need to do with their life. It's, it's a powerful thing to consider. Now, this may not be true for everybody, and it may not be uh, the case with occasional users or whatever. I don't know anything about all that. But my observation has shown me that this is what I've seen in a lot of people, where they begin to use marijuana or other drugs, and it stunts your growth. It causes you to be numb. You, you know, even people that are given uh, pharmaceutical antidepressants, you know, psychotropic drugs, sometimes, not every time, Please listen carefully. Not all people, some people are benefited by it, but not the majority, I would say. Most of the people that are on psychotropic drugs are actually hindered by it because it, it disallows them to fully feel the way God designed them to feel. For example, if you're depressed and you have a mood elevator, you, you're going to be tempted at the very least not to ask, why am I depressed? You're just going to be given the bandage of an el a mood elevator rather than say, what's going on with me? Or that you will cry. And the Bible is very definitive about crying. Crying is important. Weeping endures for the night and joy comes in the morning. That's not just a spiritual truth. It's actually biological. The, all kinds of the biology of our human makeup. We have endorphins and, and um, we have uh, hormones that are released only through tears. And it is a scientific fact that if a person weeps, those, those hormones that are released only through tears will cause your mood to elevate afterwards. That's why when a child is crying, when they're being disciplined, at the end of the day, they feel better. There are things in our lives that can be a hindrance to us recognizing our real need. Sin can do that to us. We can become seared with a, with a hot iron, our conscience being seared so that we no longer have sensitivity to the Lord. You rebel and you rebel and you rebel and you rebel until finally you just don't care. Now, I believe in the person of the Holy Spirit who resides in us, bringing what I call blessed misery. <clears throat> and I rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. Because if, as a believer, I am sinning and I become miserable because of it, I, th I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that this proves to me that I'm born again. But if I could live in sin and I don't feel miserable about it, then I have to ask myself, am I really saved? Do I have conviction of sin? If I can live in sin and I don't care, then I need to go back and say, do I need to be born again? Does the Holy Spirit actually live in me? He is the Holy Spirit. And if I'm living unholy and I'm comfortable, something's wrong. See? And so leprosy is a type of sin. Now, let's talk about alone and church discipline. I need you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And by the way, I never know who's going to be in the room when I teach. And I've had almost every single Sunday, almost every single Sunday, people say to me, man, you are going after me. All the time I hear it because, see, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. And so I don't prepare my sermons around, you know, well, Gary's going to be here sitting in the back row by the exit. I better talk about something, you know. No, I don't do that. I never do that. But um, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, I, I rejoice just as much as in that blessed misery because the Lord's putting his finger on something in our life because he loves us. He wants to heal us of the spiritual leprosy of our lives. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you 
and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. So an incestuous relationship, a guy is having a sexual relationship with his dad's wife, obviously not his mother, uh, his stepmother, okay? And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. Remember when we talked about the fact that if the sore puffs up, examine it? Uh, you've not rather mourned, but he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For it, I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. He might be taken away from among you. He's going to be called unclean and he has to go out of the camp. Okay. Remember, out of the camp. Well, there's also an indication about out of the camp, and maybe we can close with that. Somebody will remind me again, touch down on out of the camp. For I indeed as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? May I say a little leprosy lep will spread? Isn't it the same thing? See, the leprosy in this case is the leaven. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, if it's a spreading disease, you have to be isolated. has to be examined. Now, let's for the moment take a, a couple of um, minutes on <clears throat> the seven days and the 14 days. Don't be quick to judge. Take your time. Examine. Not everything is as it appears. And the Bible is very clear about that. You know, uh, it used to be John 3.16 was the first uh, most popular verse in America. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the number one quoted verse, number one most popular verse in America is judge not lest you be judged. Did you know that? But it's used against the church because Christians are called judgers, right? Uh, well, we're not judging except for by righteous judgment, but even still we need to be cautious and slow to pass judgment because not everything is as it appears. Okay. I'll tell you a quick story of mistake. We knew a guy, he was pressing toward 80 and he was living with his girlfriend. And uh, we told him, man, dude, you can't do that. And um, we met with him and talked with him, and he was really shook up and really hurt, and he left the church. Later, we found out that um, there was all kinds of details, and they were friends, and they shared as a roommate uh, the, a house. Uh, but forgive me, folks, he was impotent completely. He was pressing toward 80, and there was no intimate sexual relationship going on between the two of them. They just, but because of other reasons, a friendship, companionship at their age, uh, we're just were sharing expenses and living together. Now, we know the Bible says abstain from the appearance of evil. We understand that. But church discipline is not enacted because something appears some way. It's because something is some way. Okay. And so we learned, of course, and we've since gone to uh, the, the couple and ministered to them and they're restored and everything's fine. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, that was years ago. But uh, we need to be quick. Uh, we, we need to be uh, a people that are slow to judgment and take some time. If something appears to be what it is, let's take some time and look at it. We got an issue. We got a problem. We got a situation. There's a crisis. Uh, let's, let's examine it. Now, in the kingdom of uh, God, per se, in the church age, you are a kingdom of priests, and so you're the ones. Now, it was to Aaron and his sons, okay? So Aaron, of course, in this case, is a type of the high priest, Jesus. But and his sons would be a type of you and me because we are a kingdom of priests unto the Lord. And so, of course, we look to the great high priest who's made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, uh, greater than that of Aaron. But... Uh, in the same context, we go to the Lord, but we also, as brothers and sisters, need to be careful and cautious when examining things before we pass judgment. And sometimes it takes t some time. Seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. 
7 and 14, it's just a, increments of 7. It's 7 and then 7 again. Make sure that you're sure. Go through the complete process. And even if you have to revisit, go through the complete process again before passing judgment. Amen? Okay, so where are we in our list? Alone and uh, passing judgment. But now in this case, Paul the Apostle is talking about church discipline, saying you've got to be put out. Why? Because I have judged this already. I've made, th this has been examined. It's been examined again. We know what's going on. You should mourn, but you're rather puffed up. You're not dealing with this. So he says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? God will kill him? No. Some people teach that this means that if you deliver him to Satan, God's killing him. We know that's not true because in this case, this guy repents and in 2 Corinthians is restored. So God didn't kill him. It was just to remove him from the covering and protection of the church. It was to remove him from the ecclesia, the called out ones to gather together so that they were out there alone so that they realized, man, I'm in trouble. And part of our problem today in the church world is that if somebody is under church discipline in church A, they just go to church B. And because the pastor at church B wants his church to grow, they just say, come on in. And then their person is really not helped. At the end of the day, that person still suffers because they haven't really had the address of you've got to get rid of the leprosy. It's going to spread. And because the church B doesn't deal with it, it spreads into church B and church C and church D until we've got churches filled with people getting divorced. We've got churches of people living in promiscuous lifestyles and all kinds of stuff that's going on. Even today, now you have uh, ordained homosexuals. Practicing homosexuals in our own town. Pastors that are homosexuals that are ordained that serve in churches in Coeur d'Alene. Because the leaven spreads, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. That is unacceptable to God. And it's because we didn't judge properly and call something unclean when it was, in fact, unclean. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. A person says, I'm a Christian. Anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those that are outside? Do you not judge those that are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that evil person. And so in the church age doctrine, this becomes the parallel passage to the Leviticus passage whereby a person is called unclean and you're put out of the camp, outside the camp. Final point, outside the camp. We know that that means isolate. We know that that means that they are in a position where they are outside of fellowship. We know that that is where that they can't pollute other people where they're actually able to be identified as unclean and therefore they recognize on their, in their, own, on their own that they're unclean. In other words, you're out there living by yourself and the leper comes to Jesus on the side of the Galilee and says, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. He was able to say, I'm unclean. The guy that was blind, he's crying out to the Lord. He says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Son of David, have mercy upon me. The disciples say, be quiet. And he cries out all the more, right? Or the Pharisees said, be quiet. And he cries out all the more. And Jesus says, what do you want? He says, I'm blind. I want to see. He didn't follow Kenneth Copeland's advice and say, well, nothing. Nothing's wrong with me. See, the name it and claim it groups, they, they want you to have a positive confession. Don't claim that. I'm not going to claim that I'm sick. I'm not going to claim that I have a 
sore throat. I'm not going to claim that I'm blind. Hey, let me tell you something. If you're blind, you're blind. And the guy says, I'm blind. The guy that says to uh, uh, Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He says, I'm unclean. I know I'm unclean. And so the guy that was living outside the camp is met by someone who goes outside the camp to redeem them. Jesus redeemed us outside the camp. The Bible says so. In the sacrificial system that we've been studying here, in the sin offering, where do they take the, in the carcass and they burn that? Outside the camp. Exactly. We're studying it in Leviticus. We've studied it in Hebrews. The, the last chapter of Hebrews, I believe it is, says, let us therefore go outside the camp that we may be identified with him who went outside the camp where Jesus was crucified. It's an amazing thing to be able to rehearse. It was north of the altar where the blood was supposed to be sprinkled according to Leviticus. It was outside the camp where the carcass was to be burned outside where the one who became sin for us, I'm going to cry. He became leprous for us. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, went outside the camp to be burned, if you will, even as the carcass of the sin offering. And he goes out the camp and he is sacrificed for us. Now, obviously, he was crucified, but tell, don't tell me that his flesh didn't burn as each lash of the phlegm tore away at his skin and muscle tissue. Or that as he was carrying his cross, which we'll talk about on Sunday, and fell into the weight of it and finally was nailed hands and feet to the cross and blood rushing from his body, the remaining little blood that he had, that his body didn't burn in pain for us to cure us of leprosy. He is our great high priest. He is the one that can heal us. He is the one that can look at our wounds and say, yeah, you were leprous, but now you are clean. I'm glad. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the lessons we learn from woofs and wharfs. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that even in the midst of all of our laughing and our silliness and my uh, probably irreverence to some level, Lord, that we also have moments where we can be real with you and with each other realizing that there is not one person in this room or listening online or listening on DVD or CD or in any digital format later that is not equally leprous. And yet by your grace, not because of our works, not because of our performance, but by your grace, you said, be thou cleansed, I am willing. The leopard man could do nothing. He couldn't heal himself. All he could do is say, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Lord, for in this moment right now, make us clean, all of us, in your grace. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If this message has been a blessing, won't you please consider partnering with us? Send a financial gift of any size to Candlelight Fellowship, P.O. Box 2555, Hayden, Idaho, 83835. Join Pastor Paul Van Oy each Sunday and Wednesday for our online service or in person at 5725 North Pioneer Drive in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For service times and sermon recordings, visit candlelight.org.